That was cool. Um, when I walked out, I was walking in step with the <laughs> Made me feel real powerful. Uh, hi, I'm LB. I'm, I'm the youth pastor here, and it's just uh, great to have you all here this morning. Um, there's a, a statistic that says that 93% of people, um, um, their highest fear is public speaking. Uh, that's for 93% of the people. And so for speakers at a funeral, for 93% of them, they'd rather be the guy in the box than... Uh, <laughs> Um, and I got to say, I mean, who would rather be up here and take my place this morning? Any, any, do I have any takers? Come on, come on. Because it is, it's intimidating to stand up in front of all you wonderful people and, uh, and to bring the message, but uh, uh, we'll try to do that today. And we're going to carry on in the, uh, in the series Army, um, which it took me about three weeks. Am I a dummy? It took me three weeks to really get the play on words there, Army, and I was, oh, that's like Army. Uh, boy, Craig, smart. Uh, But uh, we're going to get into it, and, and today the, the, my title is Thinking Matters, and we want to look at the belt of truth. Um, thinking matters, thinking what we think, the way we think uh, is crucial. And, but before we get into that, we're going to do a bit of a group bonding session, and I want honesty. We're going to work together. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, um, but, you know, because we have this saying in our society, uh, you know, what was I thinking? How many of you have heard that, you know, what was I thinking? When we do dumb stuff, we go... What was I thinking? So I'm going to find out who here does dumb stuff. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a few questions about dumb stuff that happens. And, and I want you to be honest because we're, we're all together and we're going to be honest with each other. We're going to break down some barriers. And we're going to just raise our hands if this pertains to you. Now, and another thing we're going to do to build community, um, I want you, if you know the person beside you, husband, wife, brother, sister, or friend, if their hand should be up but isn't up, <laughs> Could you elbow them lovingly in the rib, all right? So this is how it's going to work. So here we go. So how many here regularly lose important things like keys, cell phones, hands up? If you regularly lose important things, passports, all right, good, hands down. How many of you have ever sat on a cell phone and broken it? Hands up. Hands, oh, not too many. That's all right. How many of you have ever drowned a cell phone? Hands up. Remember to keep the person beside you honest in the tub, in the hot pool, in the toilet. That's the worst one. <laughs> How many of you have ever stepped on a rake and had the rake hit you in the head? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look around. This is like an insurance commercial, eh? Like <laughs> How many of you have ever walked into a glass door? Yeah. Wow, man, you people are dumb. <laughs> How, how many of you um, have ever backed into in your vehicles? This is for the drivers only, um, and keep an eye on the young people here. How many of you have ever backed into a mailbox or a fence or a house in your vehicle? How many of you have ever, okay, hands down, how many of you have ever backed into your mother-in-law's mailbox or fence? <laughs> right? How many of you have ever backed into your mother-in-law? Right? <laughs> okay, how many of you have ever driven a truck off a cliff. Honestly, how many of you have ever driven a vehicle off a cliff? Okay, now to my next story. So there I was driving a truck. Um, true story uh, about, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, and I was driving a truck, uh, uh, working at Makatu for, uh, <clears throat> for my boss, a farmer there, and I was working on a steep sidling, and I was doing the weeds in my boss's truck with my bro boss's prize um, cattle dogs on the back of the truck, and I was real proud of myself, and I was doing the weeds, and the rest of the team were planting potatoes or something, and I was in the beautiful sunshine, looking at the ocean on Makatu Point, going back and forth, just doing the weeds on this ever-increasing sidling, which got steeper and steeper as you got close to this fence at the bottom, and the fence dropped 100 foot down to the rocks in the ocean, and there I was just going back and forth, loving my life, and it was getting steeper, and as, as I got to the end of uh, a, a run, I thought, well, man, this is starting to feel real steep, driving my truck proudly with my dogs, my boss's dogs on the back. And I thought, well, I could just back out of this situation, or I can just turn downhill, and I'll just turn around, and I can get out of it. And, and I thought, the key word being thinking, um, that it was doable. Um, and so I just started to go into the maneuver, and a little voice just spoke to me and said, maybe you should open the door. 
Um, so I listened to the voice, and I opened the door of the truck and proceeded to go into the move, and then it started to feel real freaky, and the truck started to get really feeling overbalanced, and I put the clutch in. Now, now just a disclaimer, I'm not a really good farmer, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> For those of you who are wanting to offer me a job right now, I'm not a good driver either. And, and I got really confused. I put the clutch, I put the handbrake on. Everything steadied. I said, okay, it looks doable. I'm going to do this. And I let the handbrake go. And then the truck just started to roll and, um, towards the fence. And I thought, this is a good time to get out. So I stepped out of the truck. And uh, the last thing I saw was the truck going through a fence, through the trees, and the dogs were on the back of the truck looking at each other and looking back at me <laughs> as they went off this cliff and they were thinking, what was he thinking? <laughs> my, my point with that whole story is that thinking... <laughs> oh, right, let's go back to that, yeah. There, someone took a photo and... Um, not really. Uh, but thinking does, thinking does matter. Thinking does matter. And it's crucial to... Um, Potential, potential catastrophe. It's crucial to your future. Um, let's open in prayer. I'm gonna, we're going to read from Ephesians 6, 13 to 18, and we are, we are focusing on the belt of truth um, and how our thinking processes interact with truth. So let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will speak truth to us today and grow us with your word, your word which is powerful, which can change us, which can enlighten us. And in the name of Jesus, we pray that you'll, you'll change us today and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read that passage um, in Ephesians where it talks about the armor. Uh, and here we go. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the famous poet, he understood how important thinking was, that thinking did matter, he said this, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Your destiny depends on what you think. And I want to just talk about three things, what we think about truth, what we think about God, and what we think about ourselves this morning. The first one is what we think about truth matters, and it seems um, kind of like a no-brainer that I don't have to bring this up, but it's because our world has changed, and the academics tell us that we're entering a new age now, and it's called postmodernism. I'll, I'll try not to waste too much time. It's a pretty complex kind of thing. Uh, they talk about it in universities, but the reason I bring it up is because it affects our young people, especially our young people. And I'll never forget when I first ran into this postmodernism, this new way of thinking, which is anti the way we've been brought up to think for hundreds of years in the Judeo-Christian West. And the first time I ran into it was I was driving my daughter and my son and a couple of their friends to school, uh, which I did almost every day when I was working in Tepuki. And, and, and uh, my daughter's best friend was this shining, young, amazing young lady who's a, a nationally recognized athlete. Uh, and she'd just come to God. She wanted to be baptized. She was fresh and exuberant and intelligent. And she was, she was just a shining Christian. And she's in the back of the car, and I've got about five minutes to go, and she, she's in the back. She goes, hey, 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 Elbs, I was a youth pastor. And she's like, hey, El Elbs, guess, guess what? <laughs> guess what I heard the other day? That I heard that there's some Christians, you know, there's heaps of Christians who think that it's wrong to be homosexual, and it's wrong to sleep with your boyfriend. <laughs> she, and she was giggling away, just it's so ludicrous. And, and I had five minutes to go. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? And my knuckles just got white on the steering wheel. <laughs> I took her around the block 17 times. No, I didn't. <laughs> but it made me understand that this intelligent, clear-thinking person who had already become a Christian was living in a different world that I had been brought up with. And, and just really quickly, our, the traditional philosophy of the West is that there is an absolute truth. 
um, that there is purpose and reason to life, that there is a right and there is a wrong. But in postmodernism, all of that is thrown out the window, and this is the philosophy that's underlying the educational system and the justice system in New Zealand today, that there really isn't a meta-narrative, there really isn't a big story that ties everything in, there really isn't a purpose, there isn't a reason, there really isn't right or wrong. And the main value in our society today is not to be righteous, but to be tolerant. We have to tolerate because there is no measuring stick and we can't compare one with the other. And that's what's believed in our society. There's a classic movie. Now, it, it, it filters into everything, our music and our movies. And I just want to show you a clip in a second. How many have seen or heard of the movie Inception? Hands up, we can be honest. I think as Christians, we're Baptists, are allowed to watch movies, okay? So again, how many have seen the movie Inception? Wow, way more of you. And... Uh, and really quickly, it's a complex, it's a great, it's a real good action flick. But um, uh, really quickly, the, 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 the main character is Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, people say I look like him. And um, <laughs> I don't know. Is he a bald old guy? Um, and he plays this guy named Dom Cobb, and his job is to, um, uh, for companies, he infiltrates people's dreams with his team. And they go deep into people's dreams, sometimes dreams within a dream, and they extract information and then sell that information to competing companies. So that's kind of the story. But the other back story is he's desperately trying to get, he, he, he's trying to complete one last job. And uh, when he finishes that job, then he can get back to the U.S. and get back to his kids. Now the thing that's going on, here's the back, back story, is that he's becoming blurred. Uh, and the lines are becoming blurred between reality and the dream life, and he's, become, he's becoming confused. So he takes a token with him, a little spinning top, into the dream. And he spins the token when he gets confused. Is this real, or am I dreaming? And if he's in the dream world, it never stops spinning. But when he gets back to reality, the token falls over, of course, because of the force of gravity. So uh, there's the setup. Let's watch this. Mr. Cobb. Thank you, sir.
Let's give these guys a hand. Hey, I think they, they, they don't, I think they deserve a hand. Don't, don't they? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because um, um, art, good movies are an art form, and they're powerful, aren't they? And they, they communicate. And um, the scary thing is, if they're communicating the wrong message, there's millions and millions of people who've seen that movie. <clears throat> there's a huge debate going over it. Now, if you watch that clip when you get home this afternoon on YouTube, there's a huge debate going online on whether that top is about to fall or not when the director cuts the film. And, um, and DiCaprio himself, um, Don Cobb, he turns his back and walks away. Now, the thing is, if you are a baby boomer, if you're born in the previous generation and living by the traditional philosophy, this drives you crazy. Because you want to know, like millions and millions of others, is he, is he back to reality or is he still dreaming? The fact that Don Cobb turns his back on the top makes him a postmodernist because to him it doesn't matter. Be, to him, you, you don't know. You don't know whether you're dreaming or whether you're in reality, and that's where postmodernism has got us to. And isn't it interesting that, isn't it interesting that um, right back at the very beginning, you know, we're talking about spiritual warfare, we're talking about the belt of truth. Right at the very beginning, when we meet our enemy in spiritual warfare in the first pages of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, that here is the serpent in the garden doing the same thing, asking this insidious question, did God really say to our ancestors, did he really say, and casting doubt and confusion as to what is real. And isn't it interesting that at the most important moment in maybe all of history, definitely in all of history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. When Pontius Pilate has the life, has the future, has the destiny of Jesus in his hands, and when Jesus says this, he says, in answer to his question, Jesus says, for this reason I came, to testify about the truth. And all on the side of the truth will listen to me. And Pontius Pilate asks that question, what is truth? What is truth? A postmodern question. But to the postmodernists, we have the scriptures, and, and, and we need an anchor in this world, especially for this emerging generation. We need an anchor. We need something that they can pin their belief and their hope on. I remember um, I had a little wooden dinghy when I first came to New Zealand, and I was learning to row it out in the Makatu estuary. There was an outgoing tide. And, um, you know, and, and I was just getting the balance right. I could see that I was making my progress through the water. I was looking backwards, as you do, and I'm rowing this little eight-foot wooden dinghy with about six inches of freeboard, and I'm just you know, rowing across the estuary. And then I look up, and I realize I'm in an outgoing tide, and I'm heading right towards a good, solid four-foot surf break. I'm being swept out to the ocean in my little dinghy. <laughs> and, um, and even though I was making progress in my own little world, the tide was taking me out. And I think it's important for us as Christians to realize that there is a tide in our society. Otherwise, we will just be swept along with it. We'll be doing our good little Christian things, and yet we'll still be being swept out by the tide of our society. And isn't it cool that we have an anchor? Jesus answered and he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Absolutely. When you, then you will know the truth. In John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then John, uh, Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. There is a battle going on. And the second thing I want to talk about is uh, what we think about God matters. What we think about God matters. Um, and I have another little farming story here for you, for those of you who do want to employ me on your farms. This will be the end of my possibilities, my potential on your farm. Um, but um, I became a Christian in my 20s, and for 10 years, uh, I was a Christian. I went to Bible college. I was a committed Christian, but for 10 years, I was battling these kind of questions uh, because I really wanted to know. And I was asking the question, you know, like, like how could a good God allow war and death and starvation. And then I, was, I, I went through that whole process of, of, is there really a God? Because I was coming from a, an agnostic, atheistic perspective myself before I was 20. And I was asking, you know, asking these questions, who is God? Is there a God? And then, and, and, and then, then I became convinced uh, through those years that, yes, there is a God. 
and I was studying, and I was reading, and if, if, if anyone here is going through these kind of questions, or if you know someone who has uh, great resources, or Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict, great books that give a thorough grounding, or Lee Strobel's books, uh, The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith. Um, C.S. Lewis has written some great stuff, Mere Christianity, which, gives, which helped me through those ten, that 10-year ten dark period where I was battling with doubt. There was a spiritual battle for my mind. And as I started accruing my answers, and yes, there is a God, and, uh, and yes, it's the God of Israel, I got to the end of my battle, and the question was, this God who I believed in, who revealed himself in the Bible to me, how could that God love me? How could he love me? And that was, I was getting towards the end, and I was doubting, and my mind was telling me that, that this God couldn't love me. And I was working on a farm out at Makatu. I was milking cows at five in the morning. Now, you know, before I came to New Zealand, I didn't even know that five in the morning existed. I thought, I thought you go to bed at a reasonable hour, like 12 or one o'clock, and then you wake up at 10, and that's when the world started ticking again. But here I was at 5 a.m., and I'm milking cows, and I've got the cows into the yard, and the farmer's in there getting ready to milk, and I just forgot a little detail, like to sh just shut the gate that lets them back out into the paddock, just a minor detail. He started screaming, like, apparently when the cows get out, when you don't want them out, it's the end of the world, because that's what it sounded like. And he was calling me names that I'm not allowed to mention here in church. But the one I remember was useless, useless. I was also in this place of, at this time of my battle, I was memorizing scripture, big chunks of scripture. And I was memorizing, memorizing Romans 8. And it used to sort of play like a tape in the back of my head. It was just kind of back there most of the time. Um, and we know that all things work together for good. It was, it was spoken of before. All things work together for good to those who love God who are called according to his purpose. It just kind of runs back there. And I'm jumping this fence at five in the morning to go get these cows. And he's called me useless. And I have, a, I have an encounter with God. I have a supernatural experience. Time stopped while I was halfway over this fence. Time stopped. And it's like a lightning flash. Who's seen a lightning flash at night? And it lights everything up. And for a billionth of a second, you could see everything. Hands up. You see, does that happen? Isn't it amazing? And I had the supernatural experience where time stopped. And I heard the farmer calling me useless. And then I caught myself in the lightning flash agreeing with him. I said, I know I'm useless. And my dad, I love my dad, but he used to tell me I was useless. I love my brothers, but they told me I was useless. I don't like my friends that much. And they, and they, they used to tell me I was useless. And I, and I knew I was useless. I, I make mistakes, and, and I'm not good at stuff. And I caught myself agreeing with them. And then this verse, which was playing, the tape that was playing in the back of my head, which was saying things like, um, if God is for you, who can be against you? Uh, who can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? You are more than a conqueror. And, and in that frozen moment, amen, in that frozen moment, I knew I had a decision to make. I could either agree with myself or agree with my boss, or I could agree with God, and I agreed with God. And, you know, I landed on the other side of that fence, and my life has never been the same. I was born again, again. Yeah, amen. And whenever, and I still battle questions, we all do, I look to this verse, and I look to the cross, that this is the God. This is the God, and th this is the truth that we can fight this spiritual warfare with. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? What you think about God matters. Finally, what you think about yourself matters. And I want to ask you a question this morning. How valuable are you? How valuable are you? Think about that. And let me just tell you the story of Michael Sparks, uh, which I just kind of bumped into in the last few weeks. In March 2006 in Nashville, Tennessee, he wandered into a thrift store, into a second-hand store. And uh, he needed a few things. He bought, he bought a salt and pepper shaker. Uh, and he bought, uh, bought a candlestick holder. And he bought this cheap imitation copy of the Declaration of Independence. He paid $2.48 for it. And he took it home, and his wife kind of looked at the stuff and said, oh, good job, you know, you wasted, you know, probably a bit overspent, but that's okay, you know, $2.48, you did all right. 
Um, but she said, man, that, that Declaration of Independence, that, that, that looks pretty legit. Maybe we should have it checked out. And he didn't do it for years and years. It hung in his garage just as a cheap imitation. Finally, a friend came over and noticed it. He says, hey, you need to get that checked out. He did. And it turned out that it was one of the original 200 Declaration of Independences, which were commissioned by John Quincy Adams. There are only 36 left in the world. It is extremely rare and extremely precious. It sold at an auction for $477,650. This useless, useless, worthless artifact. And I asked you the question, how valuable are you? And what you think about yourself, what you think about your value matters. It matters. How do you treat a $2 fake, $2 shop fake Rolex as compared to how you would treat a $1,000, I don't know how much those Rolexes cost. How would you treat an expensive watch as, as compared to how you would treat a cheap imitation? And you know, and especially I want to speak to young people here because they live in a world where they're constantly being told they're not good enough. And this applies to all of us, but especially to young people, that the media is telling us that this is what we should look like and this is, this is how we should act. And, and we're constantly being compared to these idols, these famous, rich, beautiful-looking idols. And often young people have a low estimation of themselves. And many of us battle with the same thing. What value do you place on yourself? And um, it is just so crucial because the way we treat cheap objects is the way we treat ourselves when we believe that we have no value. And we sell ourselves cheaply and we have low expectations for ourselves because we're not worth that much. And this is what Jesus says. And I love this verse, Matthew 10. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them falls to the ground outside your father's care? And even the very heads of your, the very hair of your head, the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. And I love the way Jesus says this, because there's almost a sense of humor in it. He says that don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. And we know how much. God values us. We know that he paid everything he has, everything he had for you. That's the value that God places upon you. And it really matters. It really matters. This is the crux of spiritual warfare, that we know what truth is, that we know who our God is, and that we know who we are in his estimation. That's our true worth. The way we're going to close the service right now is uh, the band's going to play uh, quietly, and we're just going to put up verses um, from the scriptures of uh, who God says you are. Um, and then we'll close with prayer after that. We just ask you to sit quietly and let the words, let the word of God do its work. Let it soak in. This is who God says you are. As you leave this morning as well, the FIT team will have baskets with bookmarks in them with some of these statements on them, and as well at the information desk. I've got a sheet of paper with all of them on there, and if you want one of those, you can grab it as well. But let's let God speak to us.